from Kona to Yanan, The Political Memoirs of Koji Ariyoshi, Chapter 3, Georgia Tobacco Road Explored. In September 1940, I arrived on the west coast and sped southward from Los Angeles on a Greyhound bus. Its tires sang on the highway as we passed. Green fruit orchards and farms that stretched for acres and acres and mile after mile. In a few days we were passing through Texas. A commotion in the back of the bus made us all turn around. Slumped in a seat was an attractive young Negro lady, unconscious and supported by a Negro man sitting beside her. A white lady in front of me said something like, she's probably starved. I looked back again. I saw the color line sharply drawn. There in the back were Negroes segregated by a flexible line. When numerous white passengers came on, the bus driver made them crowd toward the rear and the line of demarcation moved backward. When white passengers were few, the crowded Negroes eased into seats left vacant in the rear section. But if the vacant seats were up front, they remained in the crowded area. The bus driver did not ask the white passengers to move forward to fill in vacancies, so that the Negro passengers who were either standing or sitting in the uncomfortable aisle seats could occupy the more comfortable ones. I tried to recall where on this trip I had first seen the for white only signs. Why did I go into the lavatories marked for white only? Why was I riding up forward in the bus with white passengers? I was not white, but colored, and according to common classification, yellow. I was deeply tanned from stevedoring under the Hawaiian sun, but no one questioned my sitting up front. Nevertheless, I began to feel uncomfortable. At bus stops, the Negro passengers traveling long distances had difficulty buying food. They had to go to the side door of the kitchen. But since serving white passengers kept the kitchen workers busy, the Negroes were often ignored. The kitchen help were Negroes. They helped prepare the food. But the food they prepared in the kitchen was served by white waiters and wait resses and for white only restaurants. This made me think of Kaliala and the restricted upper New Anu residential districts in Honolulu, where the white people kept non whites from buying property. But, as in the southern restaurants that did not serve Negroes but employed them for services, the white residents of Honolulu's for white only districts employed Oriental yard boys and maids and cooks. In both instances, white supremacy showed itself in its ugly form. Because of my background, a non-white who had worked with his hands as a laborer all along, I felt that I was much closer to the Negroes than the whites. There were so many things in common in the struggles of the non-white people. When the Negro lady who had fainted became conscious, she started crying. She was hungry and nauseated. When the bus stopped, I brought her a few oranges, sandwiches, and a bottle of milk. The white couple also brought oranges to her. At the next bus stop, I started a conversation with the white couple because I was curious to know why they were thoughtful and why they were unlike the others. They told me they were from San Francisco, going to New Orleans for a trip. They were not Southerners who accepted segregation as proper social behavior every hour of the day. The lady seemed more understanding. She presumed that the Negro lady who had fainted had been reared in the North. Her pride and dignity made her go hungry rather than buy food in a begging manner at the kitchen door. And the white lady commented, thank God she was reared in the North. Her husband asked me if I were Chinese. I answered I was a Japanese American from Hawaii. He said there were many like me in California. When I asked him about anti-oriental discrimination in California, he said it was not too bad. His wife seemed annoyed at his statement and she told me that Orientals on the west coast are somewhat like Negroes in the south and Jews in the eastern states. We shouldn't have discrimination in our country, she remarked, but we have it just the same. We were ready to go and I sank into my seat on the bus. But even as night closed in on us, sleep would not come to me. I was going through new experiences. As I thought of the day's happenings, the past came rushing back to my mind. Some of the pieces of my jigsaw puzzle began fitting into each other. A pattern began forming and the interrelationship of the pieces began to take shape. Way back in grade school at Napa Opo'o, a Hawaiian teacher had taught us about the youngster in Kentucky who split logs, reared by the light of kindling firewood, became president of the United States, and freed the Negro slaves. We had sung my old Kentucky home at the top of our voices, each trying to outdo the others. We had drawn log cabins in his long, bearded face with color crayons. Lincoln was not only of Kentucky, but of all America. The legal abolition of Negro slavery had influenced the treatment of Asiatic immigrant laborers like my parents. When the United States made the Hawaiian Islands her territory, she had abolished feudal bondage of Asiatic contract laborers, and thus my people were freed. The Negroes had won equal rights and privileges on paper through constitutional amendments, but legal guarantees were insufficient. They still have to fight every inch of their way to implement those guarantees and make them realities in everyday life. Could they do it alone? How many of the other non-whites would join? With them, how strong were the forward-looking whites who would fight? With them and for them to make democracy work for all. I thought of my father and what he used to say. 
He told us that the Negroes and the Jews will be oppressed as long as they do not have a strong nation to look after them. He said as long as Japan is strong, we would be treated decently in America. This was a feeling shared by many of the older generation years before the last war. The Japanese government opposed the U.S. Exclusion Act as discrimination against the Japanese people. Japan successfully interceded when California cities segregated students of Japanese ancestry from public schools where white students attended. Such acts made the Japanese residents believe that Japan opposed segregation and discrimination. But in Korea the people had been subjugated by the Japanese government. In Manchuria the Japanese warlords and financiers were doing the same. And in China, cities were wantonly bombed by Japanese aircraft. Chinese women were being raped by Japanese soldiers at Nanking and other places. The Chinese were treated as an inferior people. And to make it seem as though the Chinese were a great threat, the Japanese government was conducting mock air raid drills in Japan and whipping up war hysteria. Within the nation, secret police and thought control police abounded in such an environment. Thought control laws were enforced long before 1930. A strong Japan such as my father had envisioned was not the answer to the elimination of discrimination and exploitation of people by people. A Jewish nation or a Negro nation established on the principles and programs of warring Japan would not improve human relationships. What would do it? I knew then that I would never be satisfied until I found the answers to this and other burning questions that stayed in my mind constantly. Because I was brought up on a coffee farm in Kona and toiled there into my mature years, I have a deep interest in farms and farming. Therefore, I wanted to observe the sharecropping system in the South. When I attended the University of Georgia at Athens during the school year of 1940-41, to I took frequent walks to the outskirts of town to talk to farmers, both Negro and white. I saw dilapidated farm shacks, seemingly in the last stages of general decay, where Negro families lived. There was a school building in almost the same condition where Negro children studied. During the cold winter months in various places in Georgia, Negro students do not go to school. It is too cold to study, for either the school buildings are full of cracks and holes, or there is no appropriation for heating fuel, or both. These students are taught by Negro teachers, many of whom had not had the same opportunity for training in the segregated colleges as did the white teachers. The white students enjoyed better facilities. Thus when I heard the often used terms, the American way or making better citizens, I wondered if the speakers realized what they were saying, which was the American way, the life enjoyed by the whites alone, or the whole social pattern of master and oppressed relationship, there was nothing to boast about in either case. The life which the Negroes led certainly could not have meant the American way to those who used the term. The Negroes were kept from voting to exercise their public responsibility. They were segregated, kept from attaining decent education. They could not eat in public places or sit in movie houses or buses with the whites, but they were hired to cook the food for non-Negro customers in restaurants or private white homes, and to do janitorial work in movie, houses and churches, some of which segregated them while others banned them altogether. I wondered how the white people actually felt toward me. I noticed that a Chinese family, the only Oriental people in Athens to my knowledge, lived what seemed to me to be a lonely existence. When I used to pass their shop I noticed that their social activities were severely restricted by the pattern of segregation. They were not accepted by the whites because of their color. The Negroes, who were inhumanly discriminated against and constantly shown their place through lynching and other violent methods, kept to themselves. And the attitude employed against the Negroes by the whites was carried over in their dealings with the non-white people like the Chinese family and myself, although not in the extreme form. At the YMCA where I lived, its director, Pop Pearson, and its secretary, Miss Annie Foster, were very friendly toward me. They and the Negro janitors made my stay there extremely educational and enjoyable. I became intimate with the Negroes who worked at the YMCA, but as I tried to build a friendly relationship, I noticed that this made them ill at ease. Once when one of the janitors called me Mr. Koji, shorty after my arrival in Athens, I asked him to call me Koji. He quickly replied, no sir, Mr. Koji. Why? I asked him, Mr. Koji, it is not proper. I respect you, Mr. Koji. Sure you do, and I respect you, too. No sir, he said, I can't do that. It's not proper, but I thank you just the same, Mr. Koji. I asked him to regard us as equals. He seemed uncomfortable and almost scared. After he left I thought the whole matter over. He could have imagined that I was a plant who might stool on him if he adopted a familiar attitude toward me. He and the other Negroes lived in constant fear of the white supremacists who wanted to keep them in their place. Actually, the white people feared any tendency that would make the Negroes conscious of independence and equality. And non-whites like me were denied the Freedom OF Association with Negroes on an equal basis. The only way human beings can live with each other in self-respect and decency. 
One day Margaret Mitchell, the author of the popular novel Gone with the Wind, visited the university, and the chapel where she spoke a student sitting beside me said, She's the greatest writer Georgia ever produced. Why do you think so? I asked. She wrote O.F. the True, Great South, he answered. Actually, what Margaret Mitchell had done was to glorify the past that belonged to the slaveholders. She had actually portrayed the desperate struggle of a decadent class that went down fighting because it did not wish to give up its privileged position. I'm sure glad Miss Mitchell wrote of that of South. She recaptured that period for us we Southerners won't easily forget. The student later said, What do you think of Erskine Caldwell as a writer of the South? I asked him. He writes trash. I don't care much for him, he answered. He writes about the present, about the life and death struggles of the poor whites, I said. There is no tobacco road in Georgia, he answered. In the weeks that followed I tried to find out more about tobacco road. This is the title used by Erskine Caldwell in one of his novels in describing conditions of the poor whites. Most of the students I talked to denied that there is such a condition as brought out by Caldwell. I found that students in general resented the fact that the novelist made Georgia the locale of his book on poor whites. One day a student talked to me in private after a group of us had discussed Tobacco Road and its writer. I have heard from a good source that Caldwell acquired firsthand information from the actual life of white sharecroppers. We resent the book because Caldwell set the scene in Georgia. Why don't you go down to Tobacco Road? There is such a road, but don't expect the poor whites to talk to you, the student warned me. Then at the YMCA I met a student whose sister had taught school with Mrs. Ira S. Caldwell, the writer's mother. He asked his sister to write me an introduction to the Caldwells, and this she did for me. I intended to write a series of articles about the sharecroppers. In her letter, my friend's sister asked me this, there is one thing I would like to ask you to include in the article, and that is something to the effect that Tobacco Road can be anywhere in the world, not just in Georgia. Most Georgians resent the book because it gives Georgia as a setting. You really can't blame us. As the ground began thawing in the spring, I hitchhiked to Augusta, about 100 miles away, during the weekend. I went to a teacher's convention there in hopes of meeting Mrs. Caldwell. I did not see her, but teachers I talked to indicated that I was on a wild goose chase in trying to find conditions written up by Caldwell. Toward evening I headed for Wrens, where the Caldwells live, about 33 miles from Augusta. At nightfall I passed Tobacco Road and saw the wide, red clay road running through barren land. There was no signpost since tourists have always taken them down since Caldwell popularized the name. The following morning I met the Reverend and Mrs. Caldwell. They told me about their son, who has always been a quiet observer, always questioning, always curious. Mrs. Caldwell said he just presents a problem and he never accuses. He never blames anyone in any of his works. I thought of another contemporary writer. John Steinbeck in his Grapes of Wrath had written of the same kind of people, the Okies, who gave up their land or were forced off it. Yet Steinbeck had focused the bright ray of hope on the common people, who would keep on coming by the millions to fight for their place under the sun, as Ma Jode says in the novel. Caldwell's characters in Tobacco Road are presented as completely beaten down people. When I asked the parents if it was true that Erskine Caldwell had exaggerated, the Reverend Caldwell said it was for me to observe. He said he would take me around the sharecropper's shacks. Before we left, Mrs. Caldwell asked her husband if he wanted to take clothes to the poor. She said the Jews of Pennsylvania, Boston, New York, and Detroit area sent clothes to them for distribution to the Tobacco Road people. They understand what suffering is. As a group, the Jews have already suffered a lot and many of them are thoughtful and generous, the Reverend said. Mrs. Caldwell gave the Reverend some small coins. This is tobacco and snuff money, the Reverend said, as you may. No, tobacco is the main thing poverty-stricken people want. It helps to keep them from wanting food they can't get. It gives a burning sensation inside and takes the feeling of hunger away. The first farm shack we came to was that of the Amersons. Dude, in the book Tobacco Road, is Dude Amerson. He was out selling wood in Augusta. His wife complained she was hungry, with nothing to eat in the house. She said the landlord gave the family a plot to cultivate, but the men folks just didn't feel like doing it yet. Her skin was dry and cracked, her lips parched, her eyes sunken, and her stomach bloated. She spit brown tobacco juice that rolled on the ashes in the fireplace. Her daughter-in-law, about 16 years old, looked much older. She had snuff in her mouth. Her children, one age three and the other a year, looked hungry and tired. The mother said there wasn't a spoonful of food in the house. As we went from farm to farm, many shacks were vacant because sharecroppers move from farm to farm almost every year or two, hoping to hit a fertile field. With almost all sharecroppers doing the same, not taking care of the land, the soil gave less and less each year. It was a vicious circle. Everywhere we went we met poor white sharecroppers who seemed to 
exhausted to work and children with sunken eyes and bloated stomachs a man must have decent food to eat if he hadn't had much for generations lived on snuff and cornbread how much energy and desire would he have to work the reverend said to me he said that most people in nearby towns ignored these people and many do not know how much poverty and human degeneration exists you have to go to the sharecroppers he explained they have been pushed back to the sand hills and have gone down with the poverty of the soil worked over and over year after year when we returned to the caldwell home that evening i told the caldwells about farming on leased land in kona we talked of land monopoly and the reverend said the sharecroppers were beaten even before they started before i left wrens mrs caldwell asked me if i had learned what tobacco road actually meant and she explained it is poverty poverty wherever you find it tobacco road is not only in georgia it is a belt road for poor folks that runs around the earth for people who have been pushed back by soil erosion land tenancy and monopoly and progress of physical science far beyond advances in social sciences i did not understand all that she said then but since then i have seen tobacco road conditions in the far east all people negroes asians poor whites and middle eastern people tread that road on george's tobacco road were starving people too exhausted to scratch the worn-out soil to make it produce i had never in my life especially in hawaii seen white people in such a pitiful condition in kona my birthplace the white families were rich landlords whose predecessors somehow had taken over land from the hawaiians in honolulu in the various places i had worked even on the waterfront i had noticed that the Howley firms did not seem to approve of white laborers working with us Howleys became clerks or watchmen holding down what appeared to be cleaner jobs only a rare Howley became a longshoreman or was hired as such there was such a man an adventurous person whom i came to know intimately because of our mutual interest in literature and writing we non Howley longshoremen felt that he was a source of great discomfort to our white employers years later i learned from him that after he had come to the hawaiian islands from the mainland he had gone to Aeha Plantation on Oahu and to Kohala Plantation on the island of Hawaii to find work even as a field laborer. The Howley employers turned him down, saying a white employee only served on the supervising staff. The white man's prestige had to be kept. I was to see this manner of upholding white prestige carried out in the same manner but to the extreme in colonial countries of the Far East when war took me there. These observations brought sharp realization to me that the treatment of a large majority of the non-whites in Hawaii by the Howley employers was semi-colonial, with double standard pay and fewer opportunities for advancement. But in Georgia, as well as in other southern states, a whole mass of white people were stricken by poverty, and in their helpless position, they were further exploited by the merciless landlords. Here, the white man exploited the poor whites, who were treated as peasants and coolie laborers are in colonial territories. But being propagandized by white supremacy doctrines, these poor whites believed they were superior to any Negro. I could see how this poisonous propaganda worked. It divided the Negroes and whites of a class, those toilers who lived on Tobacco Road, which is the belt road of the poor that runs through state lines and across international boundaries it pitted one people against another it kept both down thus the poorly productive countryside kept the cities that much poorer the poor pay scale in the farming areas also held down wages of workers in cities in principle these divide and conquer tactics were the same as those used on hawaiian sugar plantations where workers from different countries were imported housed in segregated camps and used against each other particularly during times of demands by laborers for better conditions organizations like the unions would bring people of one social class together to implement and protect their rights and win decency and dignity but even the right of assembly as spelled out in the first amendment is denied by the ruthless employers to workers in the south in the summer of 1941, Governor Eugene Talmadge packed the Board of Regents and fired eminent and progressive educators from the state university system on charges that they were in, our lovers. This was costly to Georgia's educational system, particularly in the segregated white institutions. As long as the disease of racial prejudice remains, no one is free, not even the whites. To Talmadge and his kind, anyone who even spoke sympathetically of the Negroes was labeled in, our lover. A Southerner who believes in democratic traditions and the Constitution should be proud of being labeled such, for it represents a progressive attitude, but it carries heavy penalties of ostracism, loss of job, or even attacks by Ku Klux-minded mobsters. This labeling is no different in straight-jicketing the thinking and behavior of people from the use of labels today against those who fight for peace and for civil rights who are called communists. While in Georgia, I was thoroughly convinced that I must fight against discrimination at every turn, 
the fight for negro rights was a fight for my rights also and this was sharply brought home to me when war came and i was locked behind barbed wire and watchtowers in a mainland concentration center while one hundred ten thousand of us all of japanese ancestry were thus impounded as dangerous people the anti-negro and the anti-oriental congressmen from the south and the west coast got together in racial alliance to kick us around 